Thank you, everyone, for being with us this morning. We're really in for a treat today. We have nationally and internationally renowned women here who will be talking um, about the arts and gender disparity in the arts and who will tell her story. Um, these women have made an impact in our region and throughout the world um, with their work. I'd like to first introduce, um, actually, I'm going to say everybody's names really quickly, OK? We've got here uh, Susanna Weymouth. Lee K. Davis, Mernette Larson, and Catherine Pill. They are on our Gender Disparity in the Arts panel. And we have Joni James, Michelle Alexandre, Bernice Chu, and Lane DeGregory, who are on the Who Will Tell Her Story panel. And um, up first is uh, Susanna. And I will welcome her with her panel. Um, Susanna is in her fifth year as the executive director of the nonprofit Tampa Bay Business Communities, Committees of the Arts and part of the private sector network and partnership movement of the Americans for the Arts. Susanna has had, has had four decades of professional experience in business, development, culture, and education. She currently serves as, uh, on, on numerous Tampa Bay boards and advisory boards, and she is a graduate of Georgetown University. Susanna is going to introduce the rest of the panel, but I'm going to hand it over to her because she'd like to say a few words beforehand. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you very much, Nancy, for inviting us, and to Athena for greeting us today so warmly. We really appreciate the opportunity to discuss such an important topic. So I'd like to now introduce our distinguished panelists, and you can find their full bios in your program. Mernette Larson has dedicated over three decades of her life as professor of art and art history at University of South Florida. Since retiring from USF, Mernette is enjoying critically acclaimed career as an artist and with hundreds of exhibitions and two retrospectives, most recently last year at the Tampa Museum of Art. Mernette was celebrated and honored with the TBBCA 2018 Lifetime Artistic Achievement Award. Her bachelor's is from the University of Florida, and she holds an MFA from Indiana University. Mernette, it's an honor to have you with us today. Catherine Pill is the Museum of Fine Arts St. Petersburg Curator of Contemporary Art. Catherine has organized and curated many cutting-edge exhibitions, including a number featuring female artists. Catherine's also taken a very active role as an educator and writer. Her BA is from McGill University in Montreal, and she holds a three-year dual master's from the Art Institute of Chicago. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. Lee Davis is the new Arts and Culture Outreach Manager for Creative Pinellas, the county's arts agency. Lee is a creative professional with over 22 years experience in community and audience development, special events, marketing, arts advocacy, including with city government. She worked for the mayor of Atlanta. In the performing arts on cable TV, she was with HBO and other very important events. And Lee received her bachelor's in theater from Emory University. Thank you, Lee, for joining us. We'd like to encourage you to take a look at the handout that you have in front of you. It's uh, got statistical facts, not anecdotal. And quite frankly, the facts are startling. To add to those, we want to share with you the stark differences between male and female artists in the current art market. As of the first half of last year, there were only five women on Artnet's list of 100 best-selling artists at auction. Only five of 100. Overall, over 96% of artworks sold at auction are by male artists. The discount for art, for women's art at auction, is over 45%. The most expensive work sold by a woman artist at auction is Georgia O'Keeffe's White Flower, which sold in 2014 for $44.4 million. And that is far, far less, over $400 million less than the auction for a male artist, the auction record. The auction record for a living woman artist was set last year by Jenny Saville. You all may have seen her painting Propped. It was sold for $12.4 million, and that sum is completely dwarfed for the record, by the record for a living male artist, also set that year, and that was for David Hockney's painting that sold for over $90 million. At that same sale where Jenny Saville made history, less than 10% of the women 
of the work that was shown and for auction was by women. We have a problem. <laughs> so I'd like to start with Mernette and try to address this issue, and uh, hopefully you'll learn a little bit more. Um, Renette, so you spent over three decades as a professor of art and art history at USF. Your experiences have actually inspired some of your paintings. Uh, I believe that for many years, you were one of the few women in studio art position at a major university in Florida. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced then, and maybe what changes you've observed in your 60 plus years that you've been involved in the art world? Things have improved. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, things may not be perfect yet, but they certainly have improved. Uh, when I graduated from Indiana University, I went for a job interview at the University of Oklahoma. And when I got there, they said, we thought you were a man, because my name wasn't specifically. Um, and we never would have brought you in <laughs> if we had known you were a woman, because women always get married and have children and leave. But they were... They had me there, so they just decided to risk it. So they hired me as a, um, <laughs> you know, on a non-tenure track thing. So I came with three other men uh, who we all came from Midwestern universities. We all had the same resumes, basically. Um, but I taught all the extension courses in Oklahoma City. I taught a bunch of art history classes, even though I was totally unqualified. Um, and I taught drawing and things like that. So... Um, then, uh, and it, it was fine. I had a great time there. Um, then I got hired, I got an offer at USF to teach um, by Don Saff. Had a much better salary on a tenure track position. So I came here with the understanding that I would teach one art history class a semester. But I, and when I got here, my door said art history. Now, <laughs> I got B's and C's in art history, and, <laughs> you know. and um, uh, but there was a sort of a theory then that it would be better to have studio people teach art history uh, because they would give a more formal perspective to art students, and since it was we were emphasis of studio art. So I think a lot of women uh, taught art history with a studio background. That became an entree, um, and I actually taught art history for about three years. I taught every period of art history. Mm. It was incredibly wonderful uh, in terms of what I learned. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and it really affected my, my work and everything else. So it was a great opportunity, really. Um, so I was the only woman on the faculty, uh, on the art faculty, and one of the only women in the university for about four years, I'd say, four or five years. And I was told the only woman in a studio department in the state, um, uh, you know, for the, in the 60s. Um, so it was, uh, but a lot of that was serendipity. And a lot of, I know, I always am struck by Obama's comment uh, when he was asked if he was discriminated against because he's black, and he said, yes, yes, I was, but on the other hand, I had many opportunities because I was black. So he said, I think it kind of balanced, for me, it kind of balanced out, he said. I know it doesn't for others, but for him it did. And I felt that way for me, too, that in many ways, being a woman um, had its plus sides, too, um, in terms of the kind of access I had to male faculty members, not sexually, but I mean in, term, <laughs> in terms of being able to um, have more conversations. You know, I was more, they were more interested, and so I would have more intense conversations. I think I had more access to male faculty. I never had a professor that was a woman in any field in college, undergraduate or graduate. There either weren't any or I, I was looking down on them because the misogyny that prevailed then, I shared, and I felt... I was fortunate to be a woman in a man's world. I felt that I was somehow superior to other women. Um, I tended to look down on, on other women. It was a very mixed thing about looking at art, women in the art world. Uh, I tended to see a lot of the women, like Lee Krasner, as being just on their husband's coattails. Um, 
on the other hand, I was desperately looking for role models. So mm -hmm. when, but there were a hand, you could name on five hand, fingers the number of role models that existed of women artists like George O'Keefe. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, Diego Rivera's wife, who suddenly his name escaped. Frida. Uh, Frida Kahlo was even on the radar screen then. Um, so um, so I, I was sort of a, a woman in the man's world, I guess, then. And uh, then in the 70s, things started to really change. I always felt, um, I guess I felt somewhat competitive with other women that were peers, but I always felt extremely supportive of younger women and women students and encouraging of, of women students. But by the 70s, when feminism really started to come into play, um, I started to become really aware of, especially writers like Virginia Woolf, who was an extremely important person for me, but Gertrude Stein and um, all the, the women uh, that I started to read, their writing became very important to me. And then the feminist movement made me very aware um, of, of women, and I became much more um, proactive, I guess, in the, in the uh, trying to work. And I began to see it as a political uh, issue that needed to be dealt with. Um, so th that was a really major um, major turning point, I think, uh, for me. And then that's been a trajectory that has been going on now for 50 years, 40 years, 40 or 50 years. Of, um, and the art department uh, at USF, for example, has probably a third. Uh, one thing that sort of can be sort of misleading in the statistics is that, for example, in a museum, um, yes, the percentage of women is very little, but if you're a museum, you're not going to sell half your work so that you could bring in, you know, so you're going to have this big mass of things so that you're going to add very slowly. The same thing with art department faculties is that you're not going to fire half the people so that you can now have half women. So it's very slow. Uh, especially since the amount of money being given to education has been going down for 30 years. Um, it's been slow building up the number of, of women, but I think that there are a lot more women in, in faculties and art departments. Um, there have always been, I think, women in administrative positions in art in the art departments. Um, and there have been more women art historians, although there's also bias in that, in that field. Uh, because I think that women um, uh, in those positions are seen as custodians or, or mothers or whatever, or caretakers of the artists. Um, and the really creative people are the men. The geniuses are the men, and the women are the people that support those men. So in, in uh, administration and art history, there's a little bit, a little bit more acceptance of women. Now I think, and, and uh, uh, Catherine can talk a lot more about this, there's just a huge amount of women curators. <laughs> uh, it's sort of a yes. burst of We're going to get to that in, uh, yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. But uh, Marnette, you said something very important about the lack of role models, and I would just like to distinguish you as a role model. And I'd like to put this in a bit of context as to what your achievements have done. So according to the National Endowment of the Arts, 51% of artists working today are women but only 3 to 5% of artworks and permanent collections of major museums in the U.S. are by women artists. A brand new study that was just published, literally just a few weeks ago on June the 3rd, shows that artists in 18 of the top museums in the United States, of those, 87% are male. So all the more remarkable, Mernet, and you're to be congratulated that your artwork is collected and exhibited in museums including the Whitney Museum of Art, LACMA, Carnegie Museum of Art, the Walker Art Center, the Tampa Museum of Art, and many others. And last year, as I mentioned, the Tampa Museum of Art held a 60-year retrospective of your work. So you yourself have been a pioneer, and you have faced these challenges, and I think it's safe to say that many, many women, not just women artists, take you as a great role model. So thank you for your courage. So I'd like to 
ask you, Marnette, a little bit about Mary Gabriel's book that you uh, recommended to me and which really I do recommend to all of you. Uh, this is The recent book is called Ninth Street Women, and it brings to light the abstract expressionist female artists such as Lee Krasner and Elaine de Kooning. And these were women artists who for many years, as you say, were seen to be riding on the coattails of their rather more famous male artist husbands. They were, however, highly regarded in the 50s, what happened? Because their prestige seems to have um, gone away for a while. Now they're being rediscovered. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it was not so much in the 50s as in the 30s uh, that because, and I really wasn't that conscious of that, but like Lee Krasner was born in 1908, I think, or something. And so she, a lot of them were in New York in the 30s. Um, and all the men and all the women were poor. I mean, de Kooning and... and Pollock and everyone were, were, were really poor. I mean, it was the Depression. So um, th that was kind of a leveler, I think. And so um, the men and women were sort of all in it together, and they all kind of respected one another, although there was a certain amount of macho-ness the, among the men. But in terms of supporting each other as artists, there seemed to be a lot of mutual a lot of mutual support. And everyone acknowledged then in the 30s that Krasner was Pollock's mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Not Maine, the other way around. Yes, and that she taught, not only supported him as a, in every way, but also taught him, uh, you know, and really brought him out as an artist. So she was the main person. Um, and similarly, Lenine de Kooning, although she was a little younger than Bill, um, was a very, very strong and forceful, uh, much more extroverted person than Bill. And she was a, a great writer and wrote for art magazines and was very influential. Um, and um, so there, I think there was, if not equity, at least there was a lot of high regard. And then a lot of the women organized these exhibitions because there weren't galleries uh, that dealt with these the abstract expressionists. So a lot of the women organized among themselves their own exhibitions. So what happened is that things changed during the war. Things changed when the Surrealists came over because the Surrealists were uh, regarded women as muses, mistresses, and what's the third thing that women were always seen as? So it's the three M's, but maid, <laughs> maid, maid. Uh, um, Anyway, when the Surrealists came into the picture, including Peggy Guggenheim, um, there was then women were pushed, really pushed back. And the, at the same time, they were start, our artists were starting to be shown, and gal galleries were starting, like Peggy Guggenheim's gallery. Um, so there was a, a lot of resentment then from the women, naturally, uh, that they were being suddenly seen in this other light. And then when it really became bad for women was after the war when all the men came back um, and, uh, they, and then the commercial galleries started and the commercial galleries found there was much more cachet to have men in the, uh, as stars. And in America, I don't think the book says this, but I feel this in America, there was a tendency to see art as a feminine activity. In Europe, it was something men could do, but in women, it was in the United States, it was like um, a hobby for women. So there was a strong need to make art associated with men so that it could become respected. And, and in being respected, could also become um, uh, a way of making money. Get, you know. So once money got in the ball game, um, everything really really changed. So men made more money, men brought in more collectors, men, the museums started, all the museums started, and the museums all collected women, I mean men, mm -hmm. <laughs> just men. Um, and uh, that all happened in the, in the, after the war, in the late, in the late 40s. So that's mm -hmm. when the real turnaround for, for women being pushed back and pushed down. Not that women did any better in Europe, where men artists were ex were uh, respected, you know. But um, well, and I'd just like to point out that Ninth Street Women is written by a woman, and that it took a woman to bring to light now in our day and age uh, how important these 
then known as wives, muses, but actually, in fact, heavy influencers in not just their husband's work, but also in the overall art movement, particularly the abstract expressionism movement. And if you go to the Tampa Museum of Art, and I encourage you to go soon because the uh, exhibition ends now uh, next month in August, but uh, the abstract expressionism show, which is 100 works from the Haskell collection, is spectacular, and it has some female artists like Joan Mitchell and Helen Frankenthaler and others. So please go and see it. can I just throw yes, something please. in, one little addendum on that? Is that none of these women, when they became, they suddenly became very famous um, in the 50s because, uh, and 60s, um, but none of them were feminists. Uh, they were very anti-feminist, and I have a quote here uh, by Elaine de Kooning. To be put in any category not defined by one's work is to be falsified. Um, so they refused to show in women's shows. They refused to be identified as women. One of the things about abstract art was supposed to be that it was gender, mm-hmm. gender free. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and on the whole, they had, uh, with some exceptions, they had reputation, bad reputations among women as being very unsupportive of, um, of other women. Uh, they felt very um, proud of their, their excellence in the, in the art world. And this um, goes back to your comment of uh, buying into the whole misogynistic um, yeah, environment yeah. and atmosphere. So I'd like to bring in here Catherine Pill. As I mentioned, Catherine is the curator at the MFA. And uh, even though there still are, obviously, as we talked about in the statistics, fewer women that are being shown in museum, uh, Catherine, would you say that women have begun to infiltrate the art world and particularly the museum world more? And uh, please talk a little bit about, you've taken a very, very active role uh, and leadership role in this regard and brought a number of important female artists that should be just recognized as artists, but given the situation, um, we're going to say uh, that uh, have probably not been given this opportunity for solo exhibitions or exhibitions at museums such as the MFA. Um, So please tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Particularly, I'd love for you to talk about Shanna Moulton. Um, Yeah, thank you. Um, And before I start, I just want to say that the retrospective of Marnette Larson's work at Tampa Museum last year is one of the top five exhibitions I've seen in my life. It was just incredible. Um, So uh, when I did the exhibition, Shauna Moulton, Journeys Out of the Body, it was based on the fact that um, the history of art moves very quickly. Shauna Moulton is a video and performance artist, (laughs) there she is, uh, who really um, was developing along with the internet and a lot of, you know, um, early technology, we call them early now, but 90s technologies and this sense of nostalgia that was related to technology. And I thought it was important enough to start discussing because obviously we're now talking about AI. We're not talking about Hotmail accounts and um, YouTube videos that that she was playing with or green screen. Um, And so it was important to me that... uh, we started talking about these things and thinking about how this artist was deserving of a mid-career retrospective. She was also incredibly funny, and I thought it was something that could really work for the Museum of Fine Arts and and the community here. Um, It wasn't until, you know, I I saw the question on the paper, you know, and and the statistics. Of course I know that women aren't given the solo exhibitions at major institutions across this country as as often as they should be. Um, And now thinking back, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that the museum did offer this opportunity um, for a mid-career retrospective of an artist emerging like Shauna Shauna is. Um, But it's not the first time that we've been championing uh, women artists, and I think the best example of that would be Marks Made, Prints by American Women Artists, 1960s to the Present, which we did in 2015. And this uh, exhibition grew out of uh, the generosity of two donors, Martha and Jim Sweeney, who really wanted to help the museum Uh, correct the gender balance (laughs) within our collection because like many museums we didn't have enough works by women or works by artists of color Um, and absolutely there were artists in that show like Joan Mitchell um, like Frankenthaler who wouldn't be caught dead in a women only exhibition 
Um, and I really grappled with that because my job is to really make sure that I'm doing justice to an artist's intent. But um, we do not exist on a level playing field, and there is absolutely no shame in doing women-only exhibitions. That, that's how I feel. And um, we very proudly showed an incredibly diverse uh, body of work, over 90 artists um, from various parts of the country, from various states of their career. Um, what I'm most proud of is that we made it, we took a pretty comprehensive look. We also had an accompanying exhibition called Reading Women that looked at disparities in the literary world. Um, we invited one of the Gorilla Girls, which we can talk about uh, a bit later, uh, to come speak. We also did um, a Wikipedia edit-a-thon. So this is um, an initiative that was started in D.C. that really allows for, um, if you, Wikipedia skews male. <laughs> Um, there's just not enough women represented, and you know uh, we need to make sure that we know about the incredible women throughout the world. And so uh, we did an edit-a-thon, and I, we actually created a Wikipedia web page for uh, Marnette Larson that day, <laughs> which was much deserved. Uh, but we, I think, one of the Gorilla Girls said, you know, the art world exists in the world. Where it's not just the art world where these issues are. Uh, <laughs> Should we delve into the Gorilla yes, Girls? Yes, <laughs> let's, uh, let's follow up and talk about the Gorilla Girls uh, because this is an artist collective that are famed for donning gorilla masks and pseudonyms to critique the art world and particularly sexism in the art world and gender disparity. And they're bitingly funny. In uh, Obviously, you see one of these examples. This is one of their posters. Uh, but ironically, it rings very true. So, Catherine, yes, please do talk to us. How important are the Gorilla Girls, and uh, they choose to remain anonymous by donning these masks, so there's a message there too. But also, they're bringing to light uh, this gender disparity in a funny, ironic, but biting way. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a curator and theorist, Maura Riley, who says that um, counting is a feminist strategy. And it's ex um, that's why I'm so glad you started with the list of statistics because it's really important that um, we're aware of these numbers because they're they're not good, um, and that was exactly what the Gorilla Girls decided to to touch upon. So they formed in 1985 in New York. They were anonymous because they they were artists who wanted to continue work with their commercial <laughs> galleries, um, but they also wanted to make sure that even though everyone knew that there was racism and sexism, that was all over the place, especially in the gallery world, um, putting it out there in black and white shamed galleries. And um, it really allowed for people to uh, take stock and point to numbers and say, this is really, really not right. Um, I love this. Dearest art collector, it's come to our attention that, like most your collection does not contain enough art by women. We know that you feel terrible about this and will rectify the situation immediately. All our love, Gorilla Girls. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's this use of humor coupled with just clear facts that um, can really point to disparities that a lot of people just really, truly don't want to deal with. Um, I should also say that um, it's not just sexism, it's racism, it's corruption that happens in the museum world that the Gorilla Girls really go after. And I did want to mention, um, of course, that you can't talk about fem feminism without being intersectional. And I was, we were also um, very privileged to host the exhibition Magnetic Fields, Expanding mm -hmm. American Abstraction 1960s to the Present last year at the museum. And this is a show that looked at abstraction by women of color. And um, we were, again, just incredibly proud to show that because there are way, way, way too many stories that are not being told. Um, in 2015, there was also the Women of, of Abstraction exhibition that started at the Denver Museum, and that's done a lot to really increase the scholarship being done on the Ninth Street Women. And I might just mention that Ninth Street Women is becoming um, a TV show mm. written by Amy Sherman Palladino of Gilmore Girls and Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited oh, about that. 
I think that goes to show that this is a very timely subject. So again, um, Catherine, you mentioned something that I think is very important. A lot of times when we have panels and discussions, it's based on anecdotal stories. But you mentioned how important it is for women to have the facts at hand and base uh, some of the statements and discussions on facts. And so I'd like to share with our audience today that studies have indicated that women make up only 24% of museum directors at institutions with budgets over 15 million. So the gender disparity is not just in women artists, but also in women female artists. Uh, museum and gallery directors. Um, while there have been some heartening landmark appointments, last year the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum welcomed its first female director, and that was followed by the National Museum of American History, naming the first woman ever to helm it. And the National Gallery of Art recently named its first woman director, Kay Wynne Feldman. So, in fact, she is the only, she's one woman, the only woman who leads one of the country's top ten art museums when ranked by budget. Only one of ten. So, we should also keep in mind, and that's what the slide points to, that female art directors at the top 25 largest museums have earned on average only 76 cents for every dollar paid to a male director. So Catherine, my question to you is, does Washington's wave of female museum directors mark a sea change for the field that has traditionally been led by white men, or is the glass ceiling still too prevalent? Um, there's, there's good news out there, right? But the no, of course, the glass ceiling is still too prevalent. I've, uh, in my relatively short career, I've had the uh, um, privilege to work under two female museum directors. Um, and those are smaller museums, though. And so there, there's actually, we're almost there at gender equity when it comes to um, museums under, let's say, a $10 million uh, operating budget. Um, and But we need to change it on, on all levels, of course. Uh, and I just... I, I guess I go back to this gorilla, one of the anonymous gorilla girls states, the whole of American society is still incredibly racist and anti-women. We see the art world as part of the world. I mean, we're only just now seeing the extent of um, misogyny and the patriarchy that is so embedded and just so violent. And there's just still, there's a long, long, long way to go. But I'm so thrilled that um, these... Uh, these positions are now being held by women because there's no going back from there. At least it's happened now in 2018, 2019. It took long enough, but um, there's still a way to go. So these are really seminal appointments. So they, they, as Catherine says, they're very important. So we've talked a little bit about the glass ceiling in the arts, and now I'd like to talk about the glass curtain. And here I'd like to bring in Lee Davis and talk about the gender disparity in the theater arts. Uh, Plays written by women account for only 29% of all plays produced. That is a number that's obviously vastly out of proportion to the number of women writing for the stage and to the number of women in the general population. It's estimated that female directors and designers receive far less than half, less than half, the professional opportunities in and off Broadway theaters than men do. And yet women comprise well over half of all theater goers in the United States. That number stands at 64%. Uh, for the last decade, the League of Professional Theater Women has been calling for more female playwrights, directors, and designers in order to try to achieve parity in the theater, yet men still dominate all the top theater jobs. Lee, you come from a background of theater studies at Emory, and as well, you were the director of audience development with Horizon Theater Company. Why do you think that gender parity, and specifically in theater, remains elusive and progress so slow? Uh, I think that part of it is this, the patriarchy is a very persuasive and, and deeply effective uh, st system. Um, you know, a lot of the producers, the sponsors, directors, ven venue bookers, your board members, your owners, the, the majority of decision makers are men. So they're making decisions and choosing men. Um, I also think that part of it is this kind of archaic structure that the arts as a business has where we are uh, looking more at the output as opposed to looking at our employees. I mean, um, jobs, the, the, the 
amount of jobs that are available in the arts are you know, limited. The amount of money that's available in jobs are limited. So I think that, and then we have these grants. <laughs> we have these, you know, a grant structure that typically covers the output and doesn't necessarily cover um, the, the structure of the organization. So a lot of grants that we can apply for are not a grants that we can apply for for to cover jobs, to cover um, salaries. So I think that's, that's a part of it. Um, I also think that we, as, as women, are caught up in the, the, the system that includes things like, you know, the penalty that there is to married women and women of children, that have children that, that applies to the poor women as, as well. I mean, men have more access to patrons. They have more access to networking. They have more access because simply put, they're not going home and taking care of the kids and our families. And so a lot of the structures that are across the board um, affecting us as women are, are in the arts as well. So I'd like to just um, read why this is important. Uh, so if playwrights, directors, designers, and actors shape the stories that we tell in the theater and the stories that we tell become the world that we live in, if the stories are a group that are higher, hierarchized above those of another, that signals to the world that the rest of us are not nearly as important. So that when bad things happen to us, it's incidental or worse deserved. So at a time when women are finally speaking out about systemic harassment, violence, silencing, the hierarchizing of men's stories over women's stories can be actually dangerous. If women's stories aren't given equal weight in popular culture, then women's stories in, say, the Senate confirmation hearings are too easily dismissed as dubious, minor, inconsequential, confused. <laughs> Lee, I'd like to come back to you. You were special events manager for the city of Atlanta, and you served as the chief liaison between entertainment industry executives we all know those stories now, talent and community partners. Did you see and experience yourself gender inequities? Well, I, yes and no. So I worked for Mayor Shirley Franklin, and she had the first African-American female mayor in the city of Atlanta, and she had a lot of women in her cabinet. And I think that this is a part of addressing the, the issue, is that we are creating structures of women, by women, for women. Um, so that was a really amazing experience to be in, but a lot, again, of those industry executives that are coming to me and trying to get permits and trying to push forward their agenda were men. So I def certainly experienced the Oh, I'm, and I have a name that also can be male or female. So I, oh, I'm, I'm, I was here to see Lee. It's, oh, it's you. Oh, well, is there, is there someone else that I could maybe talk to the chief of staff or, you know, I'm like, you can either talk to me or the chief of staff or the mayor. There, there's no other person above me. Um, but certainly having to, to address that, yes, I'm, I'm the person that you should be talking to. But I, I think that we have to address the money. We have to address mm -hmm. that so much money equals power. And if we are continuing to have a structure where we are not using our money specifically for women-owned businesses, to hire other women, to have mentors and mentees that are women, and to push back, right, to be very vocal about that as well. When we get the, I think having our data is so important, making sure that, because men have a tendency, women have a tendency to break down those anecdotal stories. Oh, that just happened to you, or so making sure that we are using this strong, strong data and everything that we do and the conversations that we have in our homes and in our social settings and in our business settings as well. I'm really grateful that we're having this discussion today because that is part of addressing it is just being more vocal and talking about it. And that's why this handout is data. Because you can have a multiplier effect by knowing these statistics and then in turn generating your own discussions when you go out. Uh, Lee, turning to the money, 
and that would be the entertainment world. So in your work with HBO, you helped to build audiences and increase revenue for original programming, including Game of Thrones and Girls, both shows that feature strong, powerful women. Did this affect your pitches to media outlets and businesses? And if so, how? And I guess a little bit more broadly, how do you see the differences as related to gender disparity? So affecting my pitches, it's interesting. I was thinking about how there's still this idea that men can write for women and that, <laughs> and that women or, you know, and, and represent women and that if women are writing that it is only for a female audience and that the men may not come because they don't see, they're not going to, they don't want to be around a bunch of women or they're not going to see themselves accurately portrayed. Um, so I had to experience that when I was pitching as far as, am I pitching only to bring girls to girls, right? Um, am I pitching only to women focused magazines instead of being more broad? Game of Thrones is a little bit different because it, um, it does have very strong female characters, but it's a, it's an anomaly in itself. Everyone really loved that um, in general. Um, but gender, dis so it's it's such an institutionalized thing. Um, it's such a it's it's the things that we don't even think about, like women's work that we're still not getting paid for. Mm -hmm. um, it's and it, it can happen in our homes and it can happen in our jobs as well. So it's the fact that we put together the birthday parties or the fact that we take the notes or we clean up after the events or we set up after the events. And um, I think that we need to focus on more women in our on our boards, um, speaking up outside the industry that you as patrons want to see more work by women that you are co are not coming or are coming because of the the work that you're seeing um finding a, a, a really addressing your authority in your own role if you work in marketing hire other people other women in that role if you work in the gift shop making sure that the, the, the representation is in the gift shop as well. And certainly women-owned galleries, you know, working on it to start our own thing together, um, the collaborative culture and the structure, um, so making sure that we are driving our own, our own businesses. And this is very important, women collaborating with other women and women supporting other women. And obviously in the entertainment industry, that can have a, a greater effect. And so uh, the CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in the Media at Mount St. Mary's University in California said recently, gender inequity in entertainment is a global issue. If we want to influence real and meaningful change, we need to support awareness and discuss this that is such an important issue all over the world. Last Friday, in fact, Gina Davis's insightful documentary about gender inequality in Hollywood and American culture in general debuted, and it featured interviews with Tiffany Haddish, Tariji Henson, Meryl Streep, uh, Reese Witherspoon, Rashida Jones, and other influential voices around the world. There's another organization, it's called Take the Lead, and it's working to close the gender leadership gap in media and entertainment by 2025, building a community of women with the program 50 Women Can Change the World in Media and Entertainment. So this is a question to all of our panelists. I'd like to ask each of you, who's responsible for addressing gender disparity in each of the different arts disciplines that we've been discussing? We're all responsible. Uh, internally, we're responsible. Externally, we're responsible. The men are responsible. Um, our kids are responsible. And I think it's important for us to, you know, ask our brothers and sons and husbands to lift up their voices as well. Um, and I think that it's time to get really radical about it, right? So if it comes down to if you're a woman artist and you're only getting paid a certain amount, can you only give a certain amount? Can you charge a certain amount? You know, can you upcharge? Can you make sure that you're programming at a certain level? If there's, if it's 67% 
that we receive. So maybe we're only programming to that level. So just really start getting radical and um, to apply it to all, to all, um, to all of our, uh, the all areas of our of our life. Really, Burnett. I've been thinking a lot lately for some reason about um, the fact that the shows that people watch on TV. Like one of my favorite shows is called The Midwife. And I imagine that probably 90% of the people that watch that are women. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, and it seems like in the films, when the films that are about women's experience, most of the people that go to those films are women. And yet, most of the things that I go to and most of the things I watch on TV, like Blash or um, uh, all, almost all those detective shows, are about men and men's experience. That's, that's what I watch with my husband. Um, that's what I watch most of the time. But when I watch the ones about women, it's just me that's watching them. And uh, so I wonder about, um, from the point of view of the, the audience's responsibility, um, the, the demand end of it, um, what needs to happen or why this is that men are so uninterested in, for example, childbirth, um, and uh, because it's a human experience, you know, um, not just a woman's experience, and um, uh, versus why are women so interested in men's lives <laughs> that they'll sit there for two hours and watch a show about the psychological tortures that some detective is going through um, in trying to deal with his job. I'd like to jump in here because uh, in the interest of time, uh, I think that we're getting ready to, to wrap up. Is that right, Nancy? Um, so I would like to just talk a little bit about the UNESCO report that's called Gender Equality, Heritage, and Creativity. And it's founded on UNESCO's commitment to advance equal rights and human rights, including women's rights, and particularly in cultural life. To date, UNESCO has concluded that women have been particularly marginalized from cultural life and facing numerous barriers to equality and access and to their contributions and to participate in film, theater, production, arts, music, and heritage. And that in fact, what this does is it hinders them from developing their full potential. It hinders women from developing their full potential and it impedes global sustainable and inclusive social development. So we hope that today's panel discussion has helped to highlight some of the inflection points, data and variables that need to be tackled and the barriers that we must dismantle in order to enact real positive change and achieve gender parity in the arts. Thank you to our panelists so very much.